Turn with me to Luke chapter 19 and 1 Peter chapter 1. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1 first. Hallelujah. In fact, no, let's go to Luke chapter 19. Let's just go here. Last week we were talking about, in fact, we began an entire series of messages that has to do with our cooperative actions with Christ. Specifically, last week we were talking about making that commitment to action and to be able to take those actions with, with the motivation of the love of God, but also to take it with a, from a sense of understanding. Today we're going to continue along that line, and specifically, um, I, 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 will, I, I, I will make as an emphasis today, what are the foundational understandings that we need for Christ's interaction, for us to interact with Him, for Him to take the actions that need to be taken through us. Amen? As I've been saying, we need to make a shift where it's not just what God is doing for us, but it is what He is doing with us and through us. Blessed be the name of the Lord. All right, Acts chapter 19, there's a parable here that Jesus tells that, 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 that indicates that God expects a return on the investment of this life of His Son that He has placed in us. Um, Luke chapter 19, I'm going to read the whole passage from verse 12 through to... Um, Verse 26. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and, a return, and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds, Luke chapter 19, and said unto them, Occupy till I come, which means buy and sell with these while I go and then return. Verse 13. And he called his ten servants and delivered unto them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come, verse 14. But his servants hated him and sent a message, a, a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded his servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound had gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound had gained five pounds. And he said, Likewise to him, be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I fear thee, because thou art an astute man, thou takest up that thou layest not down, and weepest that thou didst not so. And he said unto him, Out of your own mouth will I judge thee. Thou wicked servant, thou knowest that I was an astute man, taking up that I laid not down, and weeping that I did not so. Wherefore then givest not thou my money into the bank, and at my coming I might have required mine own with usury. And he said unto them, and he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound and give it to him that had ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he had ten, he had ten pounds. For I, he, for then said he unto him, Lord, he had ten pounds. For I say unto you that every one which had shall be given, and from him that had not, even that which he had shall be taken away. Now, as we study this uh, and get some truths out of this passage, the Lord is not here to condemn us. Amen? He is not there to damn us. None of us, we are not being sent to hell. We are not to come before the judgment seat to be judged um, on whether we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ or not. But we are going to be judged for what is done in our own body. What we did with the investment that He placed within us. Amen? So understand that, that even as we talk about prophecy and, and in the weeks to come we're going to be, you know, as we're talking and studying about taking the, the, the right actions with Christ so that He can flow through you, we, we are going to need to, to, to study 
principles that has to do with being led by the Spirit and to be able to discern what is God and what is not God and to be able to discern where is that thought coming from. Is it coming from my spirit or is it coming from my soul? Right? Where is what motivation? What is the source of this motivation? Uh, am I being led by the Spirit of God or am I just being led by my own fleshly appetites or my intimidation from someone else or some other voice? We're going to have to learn this thing. So when, when we start talking about how to be led by the Spirit, and we talk about several principles, um, witnesses that the Lord uses, one of them, one of them. Say one. Not the only one. Just one. <laughs> All right. It's the issue of prophecy. And prophecy is for edification, exhortation, and comfort. But many times when it comes to exhortation, people think it is just to make you feel good. But in the midst of exhortation, there is warning. There is correction. Amen? And if you don't believe that exhortation, that prophecy that of which exhortation is a part includes warning and correction, just read the first three chapters where Jesus was prophesying to the churches. And you'll find a lot of warning and a lot of correction. Are you with me? The Bible says that we are not only to teach. The Bible says, Paul said in Colossians Colossians chapter 1, and I believe in verse 20, 29, for 28, he says, When we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, warning and teaching. The Bible says all scripture is given for what? For reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness. The Bible says in another place, Don't let any man be intimidated. Don't let any man despise their youth. But be diligent. Reprove, rebuke, correct. Those are, many, for many of us, those are negatives. But that's part of exhortation. Amen? So as we go through this, this, this passage, it is, it is for you to examine yourself. It is for you to see what's your place and what actions you need to take, how you can cooperate with Christ. But it is not for condemnation. It is not to belittle you. It is not, so you must not allow the enemy to use the correction and the instructions that may come from the pulpit, that may come from the word of the Lord or from the Spirit of God or from another believer. You must not allow the enemy to use that to beat you down and bring condemnation and make you feel any less qualified, let to make you feel somehow to load you with guilt and, 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 and insecurity and, 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 to, and for you to lose value of yourself. That's a lie and a deception of the enemy. He likes to do that. He likes to take truth when it is preached and twist it around by the time it gets to you. And you must not allow that. Amen? Amen. Say, I receive. receive. Alright, so, right, so we want to talk about this and I'm going to pick up, I will repeat some things from last week, but I'm also going to Go over some of the very same verses and add to it. But um, before I do, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, actually, anyway. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse, verse 3 says, Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy had begotten us again to, unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that faded not away reserved in heaven for you. The inheritance that you have been resurrected to, the inheritance that you have been born into through the resurrection of Christ is the same inheritance that Jesus has. And you are joined here to that. Well, what good thing doesn't don't belong to Jesus? Amen? The inheritance that you have is abundant and it is complete and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is what qualifies you. Now, because the inheritance is yours, because you're qualified not by your works, but by the blood of Christ, so it's legally yours, but possessing it is a different thing. And the Bible says, which means what? P possessing it, I mean, causing it to come into manifestation. There is nothing that you could ever need in this life that you don't already have via that, that inheritance that is already legally yours. Amen? Hallelujah. It even includes people. The Bible says God has given us the healing for our inheritance and the uttermost parts of the inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for our inheritance. The Bible even says that your inheritances are in, this, in the saints. There are stuff that is in you that belongs to me. There is stuff that is in me that belongs to you. Amen? 
So you have all things. All things are yours. But having the inheritance legally doesn't mean you're going you're to automatically possess it. However, Colossians chapter 3, 23 and 24 says, Whatsoever you do, do it whatever you do. What is whatever you do? Is whatever you do. Amen? That means it's all you're doing. Whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord, not as unto man, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. Whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord, and as you do it unto the Lord, understand that from the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. In other words, every moment of every day as you are doing whatever you do, if you will do it as unto the Lord, you will continually be receiving inheritance. Amen? All right. Now, that also means um, that we are born again to an inheritance, but it also means that you will not experience or have the manifestation of that inheritance if you do not do what you do as unto the Lord. If you do not do, if you do not take action, if you do not obey the word, if you do not obey the Lord, then it would mean that you will not be able to receive your inheritance. In other words, the receiving of your inheritance is connected to actions. What action? Whatever you do, doing it as unto the Lord. See, if whatever you're doing is not as unto the Lord, no inheritance. But I want you to see your actions affect receiving inheritance. And quite frankly, the main key to your prosperity in every area is not the sweat of your brow. It is not even how many scriptures you quote, as important as that is. The key to your inheritance is receiving. Say receiving. It's receiving. When you do whatever you do is unto the Lord, you put yourself in position to what? Receive. The Bible says whatever you desire when you pray, believe you what? Receive and you shall have it. You can't have without receiving. I mean, it's, 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 it's so deep and yet so simple. It's about receiving. And if your actions put you in position to receive, then your actions become very important. Amen? All right, let's, let's, let's walk through this. Luke chapter 19. Glory to God. Let me walk, let's walk through this. All right, let me just make some comments on some verses. First of all, verse 12. A certain old man went in a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and, 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 and to return. When you got born again, you, re you receive an eternal inheritance. It goes on to say, and he called his ten servants and he delivered unto them ten pounds. What did Jesus deliver to you? What did he give to you when you got born again? I'm going to put it this way. So as to put it differently to how I put it last week and make a point at the same time. I'll put it this way. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 says that you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Amen? You are God's workmanship. No, which means what? You are something. This person on the inside is something that God personally handcrafted, designed, and made. Now let me say that that which he designed and made, this workmanship, this new creation, this new, this new man, this design of God is perfect. So the reality is, you are perfectly designed. You are God's perfect design. There is no room for improvement on what God has designed and placed on the inside of you, which is his workmanship. Amen? It's perfect. Say perfect. perfect. And, 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 you know, the Bible says that we are perfected forever. I think it's Hebrews 10 verse, verse 14. But just, just a little bit about this workmanship. Just a little bit about what God has designed. About that perfection. God's design. You are God's design. And he's designed you to reign with him throughout eternity. This design of God, according to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, this design of God, God has called you, He has graced you, and He has put purpose in you. You are designed with the glory of God on the inside of you, treasures in this earthen vessel. 
Your, this perfect design that you are stands before God Almighty. He who is pure and perfect and holy and is a consuming fire. You stand before Him holy, blameless, without reproof. Um, I think Colossians 1 verse 22. You are as Jesus is, perfectly designed. You are the expression of Jesus in the earth. You are of his fullness you have received. You are complete and entire in Christ, lacking nothing. You are designed by the Spirit of God, by the handiwork of God, to hear from God. The Bible says you are a sheep and you what? Hear his voice. Say, I'm designed to hear. Now, we're going to go through this a lot faster by you cooperating, and I could get this inside of you quicker. Amen? So flow with me. We don't have a lot of time, so let's get to this. Say, I'm designed to hear. Now, not only are you designed to hear, but you are, the, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, I has not seen, nor has ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of men the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God reveals them unto us by his spirit. That means what? You are designed to see the truth. You are designed to see things that the five physical senses cannot pick up. Say, I'm designed to see. And it goes on to say um, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and, and, and around verse 12. It goes on to say, we have not received the spirit of the world, but we have received the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. How do you like being in a wandering zone? Well, don't you like to be in the know? Well, we are, you are designed to know the things that are freely given to you by God. The Bible says we receive an unction from the Holy One and we know all things. That anointing abides within us. It teaches us all things. And we know. Say, I'm designed to know, to hear, to see. As Jesus is, so am I in this world. Now, here, let me give you this if you can take it. And you can take it. Yes. <laughs> the Bible says, but let me, let me be very scriptural. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, that we might know how we ought to behave ourselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. The Amplified says the prop and the support of truth. The body, we are the church, which is his body, the ground and the pillar of truth. The church, which is the ground and the pillar of truth. Are you part of the body of Christ? Are you? Yes. So you are the body of Christ. Jesus is the head, you are the body. The same life is in the head, is in his body. The, body. the body has the same DNA. And the head is truth. He is the truth. That means the body is the ground and the pillar of truth. That means you are. Now, I'm going to say this real carefully. You are the truth. If your spirit man could pop out of you and everybody see it, they would see the truth walking around. They would see the truth walking around. It would be no deception. It would be the reality of what is already written and settled in heaven. That is why when we understand that, we are to be the manifestation of the truth. Say, I have the manifestation of the truth. And, you, you, and your, your, your spirit man don't know how to quit. He can't be intimidated. He doesn't get tired. The Lord is the strength of his life. Can you imagine if the Lord is genuinely the strength of your life? Can you imagine that that was true? <laughs> imagine that it's true that the Lord, Almighty, Almighty God, He is your strength and the strength of your life. And that strength is in Fused into your spirit. Would your spirit man know anything about quitting? Could he ever faint? That is the reason why the truth is your spirit man has the capacity to never faint. That's who you are. That's how you're designed. So this is how I'm designed. All right. 
and, and we could go on and on. But when Jesus delivered his goods to the servants, to us, that's what he did. He delivered this perfect design that had the kingdom of God. He gave you his name. He gave you his authority. And all of those things happened. Now, we need to know, and now, now God said, now God expects a return. God expects that what he's given you, you're going to multiply it. Amen? Now, but for you to multiply it, now I'm going to throw something at you. Remember seed time and harvest? God gave this son so that he could get what? Many sons. God so loved the world that he gave Jesus and he expected a return. He expected a multiplication from the seed that he sowed and many sons to come to glory. The law of seed time and harvest says no harvest, no seed, no harvest. So now God has placed this awesome treasure, the life of his son, this new work, his perfect design on the inside of you. He has placed treasures in the earthen vessel, the kingdom of God, giving you authority, giving you his glory, and he expects it to be what? Multiplied. But for multiplication to take place, seeds got to be sown. So if you want to hear it, for the truth of it, with few words, God expects and desire for you to become a God seed. For you to become the seed that is now to be planted to be multiplied. Amen? Now can you imagine, you've got to give all of you, got to give your life. To him to be multiplied. You know how he took the bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to them, multiplied. Thousands fed. God want to do that with you. But to do that, for you to do that, for you to offer yourself to him like that, you're going to have to have a confidence and a security in his love. The problem with the guy that took that talent and uh, uh, took that pound and hid it, he had fear. He didn't have faith and confidence in the love of God. And the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 1, a paraphrased version, that you and I are to take advantage of the grace. Amen? And not receive the grace in vain. Okay. And the beginning of not receiving the grace in vain, the beginning of your faith is to acknowledge. Acknowledge, this is who I am. I am designed by God to reproduce. I am designed with the very life and the nature and the kingdom of God. I am designed that as he is, so am I in this world. When you begin to think and speak and talk and acknowledge that that is so, the Bible says your faith begins to become effective. You don't do that, you don't get planted in it. You don't do that, you don't become anchored. And if you don't become anchored, then the Bible says, the, talking about when Peter, before Peter became, remember when he was Simon Bar-Jonah? Before he became Peter the Little Rock? Simon Bar-Jonah meant what? He was like a reed. You know what happened with reeds in the wind? You saw what happened to that plant yesterday? <laughs> right? The wind broke it. <laughs> it just went everywhere. Well, the Bible says that if you don't become anchored, you become like a reed in the wind. So, but in order to become anchored, you have got to acknowledge the truth. That's the only way the communication of your faith becomes effective. You have got to step back and decide, decide, I am designed to hear. I am designed to see. I am designed to know. I am designed to speak truth only. I am designed with a capacity to never faint, never quit, never give up. I am designed to be able to forgive other people's sins. You got to talk like that. You got to think like that. It is called, it's the process of the renewing of the mind. God loves me. I'm secure in him. He loves me as much as he loves Jesus. There is no good thing that he withholds from me. He has given me Jesus, and with him, he also freely gives me all things. It is a faith that it might be by grace. And then we recognize that, you know, nevertheless, there are people out there who don't want to receive the truth. We are in a hostile environment. 
And in this hostile environment, we refer to that in offering time. There are circumstances in our situation that want to... Do you know your circumstances and your and situations is the devil trying to get a hold of your town? Your circumstances, situations literally want to come, grab a hold of your tongue and say, speak on my behalf. Say what I am doing. God, you're not supposed to speak what the circumstances are doing. You're not supposed to speak from the circumstances. You are supposed to speak from where you are in God. Where are you? You are seated in heavenly places and you are in Christ. When you speak to your circumstances from where you are in Christ, then you are responding to the situation as opposed to reacting to the situation. Amen? Huge difference. Does that mean we're ignoring stuff? No, we're not ignoring stuff. We're changing stuff. Amen? We are decating. We are decreeing. We are declaring this is how it's going to be. We are the, being the voice of authority in this situation. And the voice of authority is not how loud you shout. Amen? It's okay to shout. Amen? <laughs> I don't believe that the, the house would have been shaken in Acts chapter 4 if they didn't praise and pray and shout. We need to learn to shout. We need to learn to pray. We need to learn to do that. But the voice of authority is not about shouting. It is about knowing. Knowing in whom you have believed and knowing who you are. And recognizing that you are backed up by the throne of God and the sacrifice of Christ. Now because God has so designed you and he knows what he has designed, he has an expectation from what he knows he has placed inside of you. And he expects Jesus is enemies to be made his footstool he expects you to rule over the environment he expects that you and i will rise up above the curse amen and furthermore he expects that what he did he'll be able to do through us all right now let's go back to to um luke chapter 16 19 again okay let's so let's pick it up in verse so verse 16, so, the, so they came back, and one said, I, I took my, your, your, ten, your pound, I got ten. God says, here, t- we, rule, we have authority over ten cities. The guy with five pounds came back, he got five. Five more have rulers over the next, over five cities. God expected that. He expected them to, he expected a return from in, in his investment. You are bought with a price. You are an investment. But you see, we don't want to feel like a commodity. But, so that's why we must first understand the love that the Father has for us. And we must understand it is what he wants to do with us and through us. But there is a measure of return that he expects. Amen? And hence, we have to learn whatever we do, do it is unto the Lord. Now the Bible says, in, and you could, you could check this scripture out, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, it says, Every man must appear before the judgment seat of Christ that he might receive the reward for the things done in his own body. There is a return that that comes to you. There is a reward that will come when you are faithful in in, in being a good short over what God has placed in you. There is an instant return that comes that has to do with entering into the joy of the Lord, and that's good. Amen? There is a joy that is involved as well. And sometimes your flesh might not feel joy, but when you are in the will of God and you know you're pleasing God because you've, you've heard from God and you do what you heard, there is an automatic joy that you will enter to. There is a, there is a, there is a knowing, there is a, there is a sense that, 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 that God is pleased. I know when I miss God sometimes in preaching, and I don't get that, and, I, and that, that joy is not always there. And I come away and I think, oh man, I missed it. Where did I miss it? Amen? But there is a reward, there's an instant joy that happens when you have done the will of the Lord. But this guy decided, that, but the, 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 the third guy, the guy decided that he was afraid of the mass. He was afraid. And so he took the master's spawn and he hid it. Now, the question is, why did he do that? What was his motivation? His motivation was fear. 
When in fact what ought to happen is that we need to be, instead of, he cooper, when he operated in fear, who did he cooperate with? God or the devil? The devil. Did he cooperate with the life of Christ in him? No. He was cooperating with the devil. The bottom line is, and this is what it's all about, we are to cooperate with God. We are to cooperate with the life of Christ that is in us. And we cannot do it by faith. It's about cooperating with him. But now, in order to cooperate with him, this poor guy may not have understood that the motivation I was moving him into, because he thought he was, he came to the master and said, Master, here is the pound that you give me. I brought it back. I know you were strict and you reap where you didn't sow. And he was deceived as well, wasn't he? He was deceived, said deceived. When you do not do, now hear, hear, hear this thought for a moment. Get a hold of this. When you do not do the word of God, and you are not obedient to the word of God, and you do not act on the word of God, instantly you step into some level of deception. The moment you do not obey the word of God, you step into deception. You say, yeah, but I understand. No, no, no. You're still in deception. Here is why. James chapter 3 verse 15 to 17 and it says, speaks about four wisdoms. And it says, there are three of them that are from beneath. One of them that is from above. The three that are from beneath are earthly, sensual, and devilish. That's their source. Which is to say, the tree that are from the beneath comes either from your flesh or from the world or directly from the kingdom of darkness or from the devil. The one from your flesh wants to allure you into some selfish motivation. The one from the world, all three of them actually operate in selfishness. The one from the world wants you to keep up with the Joneses. Want you to think and act and 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 and, and to be, uh, li like uh, has to do. Uh, uh, wait a minute. Let me let me back up for a moment. Do, let, let, let me break it down. There is the flesh. There is the world. There is the devil. But you can also put it a different way. One has to do with reasoning and the, the reasoning and the intellect and the senses and the philosophy. The another one has to do with 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 the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And then the third one has to do with the devil, his intimidation, his oppression, his, his condemnation, his accusation, his guilt trip, and all that stuff. His in, and, all that, and all of that. But any one of them, even the rational sounding ones, are not necessarily from God. So, but the fourth one, which is the one that is from above, um, James 3.17 says, that is first of all pure, then peaceable, etc., etc. That's the one you want to follow. But now, the issue is, when a motivation comes, sometimes it seems good. The Bible says the devil even disguised himself as an angel of light. Amen? Sometimes it comes, sounds reasonable. And sometimes the circumstances kind of indicate that maybe this is God. But do you know you can't judge God by circumstances? Hmm? I mean, Paul, Paul had, a, had a vision and a dream. Go over to Macedonia. And what happened when he did? You remember what happened? He got thrown in jail. He got into all kinds of trouble. Paul, you must have missed God. Paul didn't miss God. Remember when Jesus told the disciples, go to the other side. Remember? And they headed out to the other side. And what happened? They ran into a storm. And they were obeying God. The circumstances didn't look like, like, like this. But on the other hand, there was a guy that disobeyed God, Jonah. And he went into a storm too. <laughs> so how do you know you can't tell by the circumstances? Not by itself. You follow me? In other words, then, you have got to be able to discern, is this God? The Bible speaks, I believe it's in Philippians, that God will fill you with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and in all spiritual understanding and in another place that you might be, um, have the, that you will be filled with, that you will have the spirit of discernment. 
so that you might be able to choose what is excellent. And in other words, you've got to recognize where is this motivation coming from. There is a motivation that comes from the Lord, and you want that. God, God initiates thought processes. God can put thoughts in your mind. God can, when you delight yourself in Him, He can place desires on the inside of you. Amen? He can order your steps. In, when you acknowledge Him, He said He will direct your steps. And the steps of a good man are ordered to the Lord, and he delights in his way. In other words, then, all I'm saying there, I'm not trying to teach you how to discern right now, but what I'm trying to show you is, you have got to examine where is the motivation coming from. Where is this thought coming from? And if it's coming from the ones that are beneath, don't expect, don't expect life and peace. Because the Bible says it's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is what? The Bible says to be carnally minded is what? But to be spiritually minded is life. But the point of the matter is, you need to discern. This man didn't discern, and he ended up in a whole pile of trouble. The Bible says, the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, 12 says, work out. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. There is a work for you to do. But then verse 13 says, he is at work within you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. In other words, he's at work within you, initiating some thoughts, giving you some motivation, desiring for you to take that and take action to work it out, which means there's a cooperation, there's an interaction with him. But we have got to discern, we've got to discern him. The Bible says there are many voices out there in the world. We've got to recognize, is this his voice? Now, the Bible also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, reading from verse 14, that the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God because they're foolishness unto him. And verse 15 says, 1 Corinthians 2, 15 and 16, 15, mark it, put an X, asterisk, green pen, red pen, highlight, marker. <laughs> he that is spiritual judges all things. What does the word judge mean? Scrutinize. Distinguishes. Looks at it closely. And recognizes what's what. He judges all things. Which means that your spirit man on the inside of you will judge those thoughts that come up in your mind where, where they're coming from. Is it coming from the intents of the heart? Is it coming from your soul? Where is it coming from? But you have that capacity. That's why, again, you've got to acknowledge. This is something to acknowledge. That I have the capacity in my spirit to discern, to judge, and to scrutinize all things. So that I can distinguish and recognize what is of God. And what is it. People come as a pastor. People will come. People will come and they might have a dream. They may have a vision. They may have this happen, that happen. They may come and say, the Lord spoke to me this, this, that, and the other. And they, they could be 100% God. They could also not be God. How do I know? How do you know? People want to come and direct your life. You can't listen to everybody. If it's God, by all means, you want to run with it. With wisdom, but you want to run with it, don't you? But you got to be able to what? Discern. Well, thank God, 1 Corinthians 2.15 says that that spirit man discerns all things. He judges all things. Not only within you, but even that that is coming from the outside towards you. Are you hearing me? And he will put it through the mill. He will, he will pull down the strongholds, shut down the imaginations, tear down those high things that exalt itself against the knowledge of God, and put himself in a position so that all that comes through is the voice of God. You got to remember something. Every one of us can miss it. Now, everyone includes you. Everyone includes me. I can miss it. You can miss it. Amen. And that is why in the very, very near future, we are going to talk about being led by the Spirit of God and what are some of the checks and balances and how specifically you can judge. Amen. Because otherwise you could get shipwrecked. So, in the remaining minutes, let me just share with you some, oh, I started saying this and I never did. That <laughs> what happens when you do not do the word of God? 
you instantly step into decision. This man stepped into deception, sorry, into deception, and he thought he was, he, he was so deceived that he said, Master, you're going to be proud of me. I kept it. Master said, proud of you. <laughs> but he didn't quite say that. <laughs> you get my point? But how could he be so deceived? James 1.22 says that when you be a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word, what happened? You deceive yourself. Here is my version. When you hear the word of God and you do not do the word of God, immediately you step into deception. Why? Because if you're not doing his word, if you're not listening to his voice, if it is not his voice you're obeying, then you're obeying something else. You say, well, I'm just not doing what he tells me. I'm, I'm doing nothing. Well, doing nothing is still doing something. What are you doing? Nothing. <laughs> Amen. Amen? In other words, if you don't obey his voice, then you're obeying the voice of self. You're obeying the voice of the devil, the voice of the circumstances, some other voice. And any of those other voices, once they're from the beneath, is deception. Can you see that? You can't afford to not obey God. That's why it says, much more in my absence work out your salvation. Now, I'm not trying to scare you, but I am trying to sober you. Soberize you. <laughs> Amen? All right. Praise the Lord. So, let's just share a few things. What are some foundational understanding that you need to have this interaction with Christ? Because that's what it's about. It's about Him acting through you. All right? Let me just share a couple of them. Number one, you need to understand that Jesus is already the seed. He is already, he was the seed that God planted to secure you. The, the seed. <laughs> okay. Jesus was the seed that God planted to get a hold of you. And now that he's, now you got to understand this. When Jesus was here, he had his own body. And he's no longer here, he left. But he's still here through you. He got a hold of you so that now he has a body. You are his body. You are his temple. You are the only body that he has on this earth to express himself. All right. You need to understand that. You got to understand that you are his body on this earth. He has purchased you. He has paid the price. You're not your own. Number two. Foundational understanding in order to be interactive with him. You must understand that what he finished, what he finished on the cross in his sacrifice, what he finished, listen to this, he's finishing through you. What does that mean? What he did is what he's doing through you. He is the same what? Yesterday. Yesterday. Today and forever. Well, you know what he did yesterday? He defeated sickness, poverty, the curse, sin, etc. That's separation. And what he did is he reconciled man unto himself. He did all of that, and all that he did, he wants to do through you. So through you, he wants to heal because he's already healed. Through you, he wants to reconcile people because he's already reconciled them. That is why we are ministers of what? Reconciliation. Through you, he wants to forgive people because he's already forgiven people. Through you, he wants that, that, that curse, that confusion, that torment of the enemy that is operating in people's lives. He already defeated that. So he wants you to be the peacemaker, bringing peace into their lives with the truth of the word of God and exercising righteousness. Can you see what I'm saying? All that you, so in a way, when you understand what he did, that's what he's doing. And I tell you, he has done so much, he doesn't need anything new. <laughs> All we got, just to have the fulfillment of what he did is more than enough, isn't it? 
What do you want that he hasn't already done? What does any person on this planet need that he has not already done? So we don't have to wonder about what would he do. It's what he did that he's doing. He is the same. Make sense? So that's the second thing you must understand. What he finished, he is finishing through you. The third thing you must understand foundationally, because then you see, when you understand that, it's, it, you, you already have a framework in which you are to act. Somebody is sick, what should you do? What do you think God wants to do? Somebody's underneath condemnation, what do you think God wants to do? For you to heap it up on them, condemn them some more? Somebody is guilt-ridden, what, do, what are you supposed to do? Right? You're supposed to come. And you need, you need to come and you need to, to give them beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. We need to come and restore the breach. Show them the good pathways to walk in. We need to come and we need to hold forth the word of life. We need to be light. We need to be as he is. Because... This is all he's got. This is his body. This is a mindset and a way of thinking you got to get into. And then as we go in that direction and we become, and we recognize that the old man is dead, and I am designed not to do my own will, but his will. And then we yield to that. Then we, then we be become more courageous, more encouraged to go ahead and share the word. Go ahead and invite somebody. Go ahead and pray for somebody, whatever the case is. Amen. What he finished, he's finishing through you. And then also too, you need to understand that you are his perfect design. Perfect design. Now let me give you point four. Now this here, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to get, turn with me to Acts, to Ephesians chapter, huh, chapter five. And this here, I've heard this two, three times already this morning. All right. Help me, Lord. Ephesians chapter 5, listen to this for a second. Ephesians chapter 5, when you get there, when you get there, let me know. Say, Jesus has gotten me. I belong to him. He has secured me for himself. I'm not my own. I am bought with a price. I belong to him. And he is to be glorified in me and through me. You believe that? Yes. All right. It is finished. Now, Ephesians 5 verse, uh, let, let's pick it up in verse 25. Husbands, love your wife even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. We can say Jesus loves the church because husbands have to do with Jesus, wives have to do with the church. As Christ loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So Jesus says, this church is mine. It's my body. And I am going to sanctify it, set it apart. I'm going to cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. That's nice. Why, Jesus? Why are you going to do this? That he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, anything else, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So Jesus says, this church is my body. Now, now watch me here. I, I just got to capture this. This church is mine. I've died for her. She belongs to me. This is why I died. This is what it was all about. I have paid a price for her and I have secured her onto myself. And on the inside, I've made her perfect. She is my perfect design just as the Father had ordered, ordered it, orchestrated it, designed it. It is his workmanship. It is perfect. But there are issues in the realm of the soul and the mind and the will. There are issues of rebellion. There are issues of uncleanness. There are, all, there are various issues. But because, the, because this bride is mine and I've already secured her, 
I've already paid for her. She's perfect on the inside. But I'm not going to leave her alone in the filth with the blemishes, with the wrinkles, with the uncleanness. I'm not going to leave her like that. Even in her soul, I'm not going to put up with it. I'm going to stay here. And I am going to continually wash her with the water of the word, sanctify her and cleanse her. And I'm going to keep doing it until she is without spot, without blemish, without wrinkle or any other such thing. Until she is holy, not just on the inside, but on the outside. In other words then, in other words then, Jesus is saying, I am committed. Jesus is saying, I am committed. Not only have I begun this, but I'm committed to finish it. Have you ever heard Philippians 1 verse 6? He who has begun a good work will what? He will complete it. He will finish it. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, that he is able to sanctify us wholly, our whole spirit, soul, and body, and to preserve us blameless before his coming. And then it goes on to say, he who, that, that, that he is faithful to do it. Here is my point. Jesus not only made sure that he has secured you, but he is guaranteeing that even as he has designed you, he is guaranteeing and he is committed to seeing it through. He is committed to the sanctifying, to the cleansing, to the washing, to the renewing. In other words then, let's put it in practical terms. What he's saying, is, in other words, Jesus is saying, now that I've secured you, the devil has no hold on you, you're not in his kingdom, you are mine. He says, I am committed to get your perception in line. To get your thinking in line. To get your attitudes in line. To get your mind renewed. I am committed to get every spot, every blemish, every, any such, every wrinkle. I am committed to getting all of it out of you. So that I could present you unto myself holy, blameless, without blemish. Philippians 3.20 it says, He is able to subdue all things unto himself. And to even make your body like his glorious body. In other words, he is not going to stop until even this mortal puts on immortality. And this corruptible put on incorruption. Amen? Now, why does that matter? It matters because it tells me that even though I might be stumbling and even though I might be missing it, even though I might be wrong in some particular area, even in the midst of my sin, where sin abounds, what happened? Grace abounds much more. In other words, you are missing it in some area. There are some things that are not right in your life. Jesus doesn't say, okay, this is not right. I'm out of here. I'm going to leave them until they get this figured out. I am not dealing with this. No, he says, I'm committed. I'm going to wash. I'm going to cleanse. And I'm going to keep doing it until every wrinkle, every spot, every blemish is gone. Amen? Does that make sense? When you understand that, you will see there is no need for backsliding. There is no need for giving up. Because he is committed to see you through. What's your part? Cooperation. Your part is cooperating. Now when you understand, when you understand what's going on, and you understand what he is doing inside of you, when you understand what he is, when you understand his whole, this whole process, his end point, when you understand that, 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 that um, how he's designed you, and, he, and what he's designed on the inside, he wants to bring it to the outside. When you understand these things, then what happened is, you could understand why he's leading you a certain way. You would understand why he keeps correcting you. You understand why that same area you've been fussing and fighting with a couple of years ago, you're still fussing and fighting with, and he still wouldn't leave you alone on that issue. You know why? Because, he, because it's not corrected yet. And because it's not corrected and it's not in line, then he's going to keep working with you on that issue. 
And if you don't get it straightened out until 2019 or 20 or 22, you're going to st still be working on it. But, but that is why we need to get over it <laughs> so that we could get past this mountain and not take another trip. C can you see that? D does that make sense? But when you understand what he's after, what he has designed, what he's trying to get out of you, then you can understand how he works with you. You'll understand the reason for his correcting. You'll understand, the Bible says, if you're not his child, then he wouldn't have no business correcting you. Amen? But because you're his child, and because you're not a bastard, whom the Lord loves, he what? He corrects. He instructs. He teaches. I need to wrap this up, okay? So let me, let me see how I can do this. Blessed be. Turn me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter 3. The more you meditate on what Jesus did, what Jesus has done, the more you understand regarding the sacrifice, the more, the easier it is for you to cooperate with him. Because everything that he's doing is based on what he's already done. You understand that? Everything that he's doing is based on what he's already done. First Corinthians chapter 3. The sacrifice is foundational. Understanding, the understanding that is the foundational truth that we need to understand. The sacrifice is foundational. The Bible says if the foundation is destroyed, then what shall the righteous do? The Bible says through wisdom the house is built. Through understanding it becomes established. So we got to understand the foundational stuff. First Corinthians chapter 3. Let me pick it up from verse, verse 11. Okay, let's pick it up from verse, verse 7. So he that planted is not anything, neither is he that watered it, but God gives the increase. Now he that planted and he that watered are all one. Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. As according to his own labor. We are laborers together with God. There's a cooperation here. You are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given to you, to me, Paul says, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another build thereon, but let every man take heed how he build. And we are to be found as good shorts of the life that is in us. There is no other foundation that can, can no man lay but that which is laid, which is Christ. Christ, the sacrifice of Christ, that's the foundation. If any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be, shall be manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. You know the Bible, you know the Bible says in, in 1 Peter chapter 4, maybe wrong verse 10, I think it is, it says, have hospitality, but not grudgingly. What does that mean? As Christians, we ought to be hospitable. We ought to be nice. But sometimes I could just be nice because I'm supposed to be nice. But I don't really feel like being nice. I have to do it. So I'm nice and I'm hospitable. But I'm doing it grudgingly. Well, this says here, every man's work will be tried by fire, and the fact that I was doing it grudgingly is probably going to cause that work to burn up. You understand that? All right. So every man, what, so that is why it says, whatever you do, do it how? As unto the Lord. Know you not that you, and then it says, if any man work shall be burned and he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Yet so by fire. So we're not talking about your salvation. We're not talking about getting to heaven. But we are talking about what you do with what God has placed in you. Know you not that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you. If any man defiles the temple of God, him shall God destroy for the temple of God is holy. Which temple you are. Let no man deceive himself. Etc. Etc. Chapter 4 verse 1. Let, let a man so account of us as ministers of Christ. Shorts of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards 
that a man be found faithful. You know, one of the things it says, for those who are faithful, in, in, in those parables, that one and the one in Matthews, enter into the joy of the Lord. Well done, my good and faithful servant. And he does say, well, well done, my good and faithful servant. He doesn't say, well beginning, my good and faithful servant. It's not how you begin. Beginning is important, but it's well done. Say well done. Say well done. Say I'm a faithful short of the treasures that he's placed in me. His treasures, his glory, his life is in me. So you see, God has given you his very best, which is the life of his son in you. The question is, what are you going to do with that life? The answer is, you're going to cooperate with that life and take action. Amen?